The media likes to construct clean and cohesive narratives. A leader is either a devil or a saint. A country is either good or evil. It makes it easier for the public to digest news as it gives a chaotic world a semblance of order. But many times it completely obscures the truth. Myanmar or Burma is one example of such a country, which everyone has heard of, but mostly know the simplistic media narrative only. The country has been under the control of a brutal military dictatorship since 1962 and had until 2011 been isolated from the West, although it still had links with the regional power, China. In 2011, the military announced the start of a transitional process they claimed would pave the way for democracy. Leaders from around the world descended on the strange purpose-built capital to meet the military leaders. In 2012, British Prime Minister David Cameron made the trip, here shown on CNN. In 2014, it was President Obama's turn, here covered by CBS. This process of glasnost reached its apotheosis in the aftermath of the November elections, when the National League for Democracy won an overwhelming victory. Led by the iconic Aung San Suu Kyi, the party is now the majority in the parliament. The media was typically overstated in the aftermath. In the US, the Burmese junta was a dictatorship which wasn't allied with the US government and wasn't good for US corporations, so it was an official enemy. The media always follows suit. The Washington Post said, the generals kept freedom and prosperity at bay as much of Southeast Asia moved forward. The first bit is of course true, but many parts of Southeast Asia might argue that they have not enjoyed prosperity in the neoliberal economic period of the past 25 years. It was also very early to start celebrating. Under the military drafted constitution, the Telegraph pointed out, the army chief will appoint three key ministers for defense, border affairs and the interior with control of security forces, as well as 25% of MPs. But the momentum to celebrate was partly due to the easing of the economic restrictions on Western capital entering the country. In that context, it was in investors' interest that the transition looks real and positive. Forbes clearly expressed this sentiment in its article, Investors Line Up After Myanmar's Landmark Moment, in which it said, Arguments will rumble around for some time to come about how truly open and transparent this election was, but with a result like that, it hardly matters in the end. As shown in this article in The Independent, Burma's rush for economic growth leaves its villagers homeless and jobless. There has been a two-speed transformation. While there has been a historic rush by foreign investors to set up shop in the country, increasingly in cooperation with aid agencies and NGOs, there is growing concern that Burma's economic metamorphosis has far outpaced its transition to democracy. Local activists say it is difficult to oppose the economic programme in any respect, as many remain fearful of the government. The excitement of Western multinational corporations is not hard to understand. Burma, one of Southeast Asia's poorest countries, is the ultimate, and some would say last, frontier market. The country sits between the world's two most populous countries, India and China. It is rich in natural resources like oil and gas, as well as precious stones, which include jade and sapphire. It has a vast labour force, with wages undercutting its neighbours. The Independent quotes Keith Wynne, who founded the Myanmar British Business Association to help British companies move into the country. Everyone wants to have an influence and get in in terms of business. Whether it's China or the UK or the US, I think everybody is looking at opportunities. Foreign investment in Burma reportedly rose to a record high in 2014 to 2015, reaching $8 billion, or more than twice the amount in the previous year. But the transformation happening in Myanmar is very much in keeping with the neoliberal dictates of Western governments and institutions. Privatisation, opening up to foreign investors and the rest. In early 2014, the Wall Street Journal hailed such reforms in its article, Myanmar Farmland Gets Closer to Vision as Economic Engine, about the construction of a special economic zone where corporations could work in a nice, relaxed regulatory environment. This economic engine, it says, would allow investors to bypass the red tape in Myanmar, ending the article with the triumphant words of a Washington DC analyst that money is pouring in. 18 months later, the Wall Street Journal reporting that Myanmar had opened the Japanese-backed special economic zone stated that the project was lending a boost 
to the economic reform credentials of President Thane Sen ahead of crucial elections. Thane Sen is a brutal military dictator, but no matter, he's allowing his country to be bought up. Therefore, he is a reformer and in the right direction. The Tilawa Special Economic Zone, or SEZ as it's being referred to, is in fact a controversial project to carve out 2,400 hectares of land near a major port for foreign investors. 30 corporations, mostly Japanese, have already signed up to open factories at Tilawa. The US company Ball Corporation will bottle Coca-Cola here. It has been billed as a key development project that could provide tens of thousands of jobs. But for hundreds of local villagers, it is already described as nothing short of a disaster. The Independent article quotes Dorwin, who is one of almost 400 people that have already been displaced to make way for the SEZ. Thousands more are expected to follow suit in the coming year. I can't even sleep at night, I'm so stressed, Wynne told the Independent. She explains that the government's resettlement site is too far from where people used to work and that there's no land to farm. The Burmese government, for its part, is rushing through dozens of new laws and programmes to make the country more attractive to foreign capital. Dilawa is just one of three special economic zones being built. Market-orientated reforms are a key part of Burma emerging from decades of isolation, according to the World Bank, which called for greater progress on removing barriers for businesses. Human Rights Watch warned that a draft investment law being prepared with support from the World Bank's International Finance Corporation failed to protect human rights or prevent environmental damage. The law, said Jessica Evans at Human Rights Watch, will be a legal cornerstone of Burma's efforts to re-engage with the global economy and international investors. It's more important for Burma to get this right than to do it quickly. And what much of the media ignored was that repression was actually picking up in the build-up to these transformative elections. Bloomberg, to their credit, detailed how the repression of rights in Myanmar had increased ahead of the elections. This was based upon a report by Amnesty International, which stated that Myanmar's authorities have been locking up and harassing scores of peaceful activists as part of an intensifying and far-reaching crackdown ahead of November's elections. Aid agencies are also guilty of taking advantage of the opening without considering that the place is still run by a brutal military dictatorship. Here, in a local Burmese publication, the Irrawaddy, in an article titled The Spoils of Aid in Burma, Transition a Boon for Former Dictators, the writer states, the popular media narrative of Burma's steady transition from dictatorship to democracy is finally starting to crumble as irrefutable evidence piles up that Burma's transition is fraught with problems and has been steadily reversing for more than a year. Yet the aid money continues to flow. Much about this country remains entirely unchanged. Real political and economic power remains firmly in the grip of former generals, their business cronies and the military-dominated government in the new capital of Naypyidaw. With that in mind, shouldn't aid agencies be wary of cutting deals with former dictators and their kin, or at least refrain from renting their properties? It's a good question that no one in the mainstream media wants to answer. Do the same generals that have built a multi-million dollar new capital really want to hand over power now? In this Guardian article, the weirdness of the new capital is outlined, saying, it looks like an eerie picture of post-apocalypse suburban America, like a David Lynch film on location in North Korea. But its whole geography is centered around keeping the population under control. The streets, clearly designed for cars and motorcades, not pedestrians nor leisurely strolls, have up to 20 lanes and stretch as far as the eye can see. The rumour is these grandiose boulevards were built to enable aircraft to land on them in the event of anti-government protests or other disturbances. The other side of Burma's transformation has been the deification of Suki, who is no doubt a brave woman. But another problem for those talking up the transformation in Myanmar is the ongoing genocide against the Rohingya minority in the country, which Suu Kyi has pointedly refused to take on as an issue. Some progressive media have commented on it, like this article in The Guardian, which asks, why is Aung San Suu Kyi silent on the plight of the Rohingya people? But most of the media don't want their deification of her sullied by such unfortunate facts. In this New York Times news article, Suu Kyi is described as a radiant symbol of dignified nonviolent resistance, 
But how does this newspaper of record describe brave dissidents in dictatorships allied with the US? Most of them are just ignored. Sky News recently actually reported a campaign of genocide against Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, reporting that Yale Law School announced that there is persuasive evidence that genocide is being committed. The reporter wrote that in one camp clinic, we found patients who were frightened of being sent to the hospital in a state capital six miles outside the camp because they were afraid they would be beaten. How can a government involved in a genocidal campaign against one of its minorities be perceived as progressive and on the road to transition, especially when the main opposition is silent about the persecution as well? But these are nuances the media doesn't want to deal with. There is hope in the country, no doubt, but it's in too many people's interest to gloss the change. And who will benefit in the long term might be familiar to anyone who has seen the Western-backed economic transformation of countries as diverse as South Africa and Russia.